Hey everyone, I'm Lance Gibson, and we're so glad you're joining us online for worship today. While we're waiting for the service to start, we would love to know who you are and where you're watching from. So feel free to say hello in the comments section down below. Now is also a great time to like and share this video so that your friends and family can join us as well. I'm looking forward to our time together this morning as we worship through singing, prayer, and the study of God's word. Thanks again for being here. The service will begin shortly. Good morning, Quail Springs. How we doing this morning? You doing all right this morning? It's a good morning to be in the house of the Lord. Hey, we want to welcome you to Quail Springs Baptist Church. We have a connect card there in front of you that we'd love to connect with you, get information so that you can get plugged in here at Quail Springs Baptist Church. Hey, it's a special morning for Quail Springs because it is Senior Sunday. It's a really exciting time as we have our seniors graduating through the student ministry and we get to recognize them on this Sunday morning. 
I want to share a couple words about this class and what it's meant to me and Brittany to, to lead them and to be a part of their journey. What I love about Senior Sunday is that you're about to see students on these steps that have grown up in this church. You've seen them in the nursery. Some of y'all have held them in the nursery. You've seen them wobble around the hallways here at Quail Springs. And you're going to see they're grown up now. They're about to go off to college. And there's some that you may not recognize. And that's because of the faithfulness of our students that have invited them here. And for some of them, an invitation brought them here to Quail where they heard the gospel and gave their lives to Jesus. And they were baptized and now they're living for the Lord. It's an incredible Sunday to see the church bring up believers to send them out in Jesus' name. And as I look, as it's the beginning of May, it's Senior Sunday, I think to myself, wow, time has flown by. Four short years ago, Brittany and I came to Quail Springs. Four short years ago, the second week on the job for a non-native Oklahoman, I found myself at Falls Creek with absolutely no earthly idea what I was doing. And the eighth grade class, as the middle school pastor, the eighth grade class was this class. And I had just a short couple months with them. But I'll never forget the memories that we made that summer. I'll never forget the memories where we were playing ultimate frisbee in front of Hober and we were having uh, some fun times at camp and at our fellowships. It, It had a deep impact on me and Brittany and really propelled us into our ministry at Quail Springs and propelled me and Brittany into deep relationships with them because we only had them for a couple months. But that relation stood the test of them going into high school. Brittany and I have watched from afar as they've journeyed through high school and have been impressed with how the Lord has worked and in and through them. There's no doubt in our minds that, the, that this class will have an impact for the kingdom of God in their next chapter. There are three words that come to mind when I think of the class of 2022. The first one is they are gifted. Brittany and I have talked through how wise and knowledgeable they are from our years with them. We've gotten to recognize and see their giftings from afar as well as up close. Everyone has a specific talent that adds to the overall dynamic of this class. Whether that be athletics, academics, student council, their spiritual gifts. And I'm proud how they've recognized their giftings and they've been intentional in utilizing them for the name of Jesus. Their communities, their friendships in this church are different because of their intentionality of making the name of Jesus famous. My prayer is that they would continue to utilize their giftings for the name of Jesus. The second word when I think of this class is that they are tenacious. The class of 2022 is tenacious. They have not always been the largest class, though they're, they've been a smaller size, their presence has always been known in the student ministry. They, they brought the spirit and persevered through the end. They had a transition at the end of their middle school year with me coming in and Nick Johnson going to pastor in Southern Oklahoma. They had a transition with COVID and all that craziness. And then they had a transition halfway through their junior year as I stepped in to be their student pastor. They never laid down and they never gave up, but they continue to fight to stay faithful, to stay connected to this church family. There are stories upon stories that can be told of their tenacious ability to persevere and tell others about Jesus. And the third and final word that describes this class is that they have finished well. Brittany and I have been blown away by their way, the way they've finished their student ministry years. They understand the importance of linking arms with one another for the purpose of becoming more like Jesus. They showed up and they showed out. This has had ripple effects on, of impact in our student ministry. First, it's impacted me and Brittany as we've been encouraged by their faithfulness and their kindness to Noble. It has an impact on our students. They've seen what it looks like to follow Jesus and to lead later on in their high school years and to stay connected to the church. I also believe that finishing well has impacted them. From scripture, we know that God's word is living and active. We know that it's profitable and does not return void. And this class has committed themselves to sit under the teaching of Pastor Rummage and myself in the student ministry and in their connect group leaders and their D group leaders and in their personal time with the Lord. These students love the word of God. And I'm thankful for that. Brittany and I have come to, Brittany, we've seen their friends come to know Jesus for the first time because of their faithfulness to share the gospel. And we are so encouraged to see them walk with Jesus now. Brittany and I are so thankful and proud for them. We're thankful for the memories that we have had together for the opportunity to play a small role in their process of becoming more like Jesus. 
From our short years with this class, we are convinced they will do big things for the kingdom of God. Our desire for them is that they would continue to grow in and would be known by their love for God, their love for others, and their commitment to make disciples of Jesus. I count it a high honor and a supreme joy to be called their student pastor. Our family is grateful for them and our family loves them deeply. I'm going to call Pastor Romage up to the stage and we're going to announce them. They're going to come out single file and they're going to come and stand before you on the stage. Um, so here, here that goes. First off, Nolan Atkinson. If you'll hold applause till the end, we can erupt in applause. Isabel Bryant. Lexi Carter. Kenna Klein. Kate Coffey. Ella David. David DeMonja. Lane Goley. Audrey Grace. Camden Greenhall. London Harper. We will recognize another student, Caleb Heskew. His family is serving with the IMB, so they are overseas serving right now, but we know that he's about to come to Bison Hill for college, so we're grateful that we're going to see him soon. Hadley Hill. Alice Hobbs. Laura Johnson. Kylie Keene. Jenna King. Lauren Lamb. Christian Lemus. Brinley Logan. Landon Loud. Taylor Melton. Grayson Miller. Elijah Phillips. Hannah Schaffner. and Josh Whitehead. Church, would you stand and show your appreciation for the class of 2022? Join with me as we pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this good day. And Lord, I thank you for each graduate, for each family, 
And I pray, God, your blessing on them today and in the days to come. Lord, I pray for each of these graduates as they go out from high school and as they begin the next steps you have for them. Lord, use them. Empower them. Give them courage to walk with you day by day. Lord, keep them close to you. And Lord, I thank you for moms and dads and aunts and uncles and grandparents and others who have prayed faithfully for these graduates each step along the way. Lord, I know that they will continue to lift them up and to pray for them in the days to come. And Father, I pray that you would be honored in the lives of each one of these young people. We give you glory, we give you praise, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. Let's express our appreciation one more time to our graduates. Amen. What a blessing to honor these students, church. We're going to sing together. We're going to put our faith and our trust in Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You make it easy to love you. You are good and you are kind. You bring joy into my life. You make it easy to trust. in you, Jesus.
Y'all can have a seat.
What a great, great day it is to be in the Lord's house. I love Grad Sunday. I love seeing the graduates come in. And so if you're here today for Graduate Sunday as our special guest, we are really glad that you're here today. And then to all of our grad families, to moms and dads and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and grandparents and close friends, to every one of you, I know that you share in the joy with your graduate. And so we just praise the Lord for each of these young people and how we know God's going to use them in the days to come. It's good to see each of you here at Quail Springs Baptist Church today, whether you're joining us in person or online. We're really thankful that you're here with us today. And if this is your first time with us or if you've never received a gift from us as our guest, if you've been visiting here and you haven't gotten a gift from us yet, I want to make sure we get one of those gifts in your hands. After our services are over today, I'll be out in the archway at the welcome desk along with some other folks. And uh, we would love to meet you. I'd love to meet you face to face. And also we'd love to give you that gift we have as our way of saying thanks for being our guest here today. There's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. If you have a prayer request, if there's something on your heart and your life that you want us to be praying for, it would be our joy to pray for you this week. As you make your way out, you can put your guest information or your prayer request on that connect card and place that in one of the black boxes where we give our tithes and offerings each week. Again, we are really thankful that you're here today. I want to let you know about something as you make your way out today. You will find invite cards to the series that I'm doing right now, Healing Your Hidden Hurts. It's just a little card, business side card, size card. I hope that you'll take several of these with you. On the front, it just advertises the series itself. On the back, each date and each sermon title is there so that people that you invite will know the different hurts we'll be addressing each week. And, and I really believe that God is going to use this series. I, I think he already is using it to address some real needs in the lives of people. So this is an opportunity for you to invite folks. Make sure you pick up some of those invite cards. And then I want to let you know about something else before I get into my message today. I've been praying about something for a long, long time, and tomorrow it is coming into fruition. I've been praying that we'd be able to get our daily Bible teaching broadcast ministry moving forward back on the air here every day in Oklahoma City. And beginning tomorrow at 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, we'll be on bot radio throughout Oklahoma City, number of bot stations that we'll be on. We're already on every Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m., and we're going to have some invite cards for you uh, for that as well, because listen, it's a simple way for you to expose people to the teaching ministry of your church. And you know, it's really, listen, if you're listening to me preach on the radio, it's an awesome thing in this way. If you don't like what I'm saying, if you get tired of me, you just turn it right off. You don't have to keep it on. You can turn it off. Some of you turn me off when I'm up here preaching in the, in the auditorium. But anyway, you can, you can turn it off. You can turn it on. But it's a way for people to, to hear and to hear the gospel and to grow in Christ and then also at the end of every broadcast, we're inviting people to our Sunday morning services here at Quail Springs Baptist Church. So that's on Bot Radio starting tomorrow at 6 in the evening, Monday through Friday. Right now, I want you to take your Bibles. Turn with me, please, to the book of Psalms. Psalm 56 is our text today. And today I'm preaching on this hidden herd. I want to talk to you about facing your greatest fears. We're going to talk about how God can give you the power and the grace to face the biggest fears in your life. Pastor Tony Evans tells about a film crew back in the 1930s, and they were recording, they were capturing the film as an aircraft from Germany, a big airship, had crossed across the Atlantic, and it was attempting to land in the United States. As they were getting ready to land, they dropped all these ropes to the ground and they were, there were sailors on the ground, and their job was to grab hold of these ropes and to help pull the aircraft into place. And the footage shows as two sailors grabbed hold of the same rope, one on a higher place of the rope than the other, and just about as soon as they grabbed hold, wind came in and began to pick that aircraft up. That balloon began to go up in the air again, those two sailors were holding on. They were holding on even as it picked them up off the ground, but they were afraid to let go. 
And so the film shows as they went higher and higher, their uniforms were just flapping in the wind. And eventually they were a thousand feet above the ground and their grip would not hold. Both of them plunged to the ground and tragically died. Their fear held them and their fear destroyed them. Now most of the fears that we face are not literal life and death fears. But at the same time, most of us have found ourselves holding on to the small end of a big problem and wondering if we were going to make it and experiencing very real fear. What do you do when you experience fear? And the truth is every person here has something that we're afraid of. Most of us are facing some type of fear right now, and fear has always been there, but it seems like that COVID and all the things that have gone along with it have magnified and amplified and intensified our fears. People are wondering and fearing, what's next? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen with the economy? What's going to happen with the war in Europe? What's going to happen with, with my health and, and, and my future? People have those kinds of fears. And then the other fears that we have, well, what's the future going to look like? And what are things going to look like for my kids or my grandkids? Real fears that we face every day. Here's the good news from God's word. Our God is greater than our greatest fears. And as we trust in him, he'll give the power to us to overcome those fears as we turn our faces to him. And that's what we find David doing in Psalm 56. I want you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. And we're gonna to read together this whole Psalm. It's a beautiful Psalm where David expresses his trust in God in the midst of real fears. Now, don't forget, this is David. This is a guy who conquered a giant named Goliath when David was still a teenager. He knew what it was like to stand up to real fear and to conquer it. This is David. This is someone who led armies into battle over and over and over again and fought right there with them because he knew how to have courage in the face of fear. And yet, as David writes these words, he was experiencing real fear and he was trusting God in the midst of his fear. Beginning in verse one of the Psalm, David says, be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day. For there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day, they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together, they hide, they mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity? In anger, cast down the peoples, O oh God. You number my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, because God is for me in God. I will praise his word. In the Lord, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of of the living. This is the word of God. Join with me as we pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this good day that you've given us. Lord, I pray that in these moments you would move me out of the way and Lord, that you would speak. I pray God that you would speak to those who are experiencing real fears today. Some are fearing because of their health. Some are fearing because of someone they love who is in a serious situation today. Some are fearing because of their future. Some are fearing because of the things that they hear and they see constantly in the media that just stirs up their fear. Lord God, we thank you that whatever our fears are, you are greater. 
So Lord, teach us to look to you as you face our fears. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. I want us to look at this passage of scripture together and I want to talk to you about how God can empower you to face and to overcome your greatest fears. And as we look at this psalm, I want to talk to you about three things. The first thing I want you to see in this text, think with me about the reality of fear. The reality of fear. As we encounter David in this psalm, David was facing real fear. Now, if you look in your Bible, you'll notice that before the first verse of this psalm, there is a superscription. There, there's something written above the first verse. And while this is not part of the psalm itself, it is part of the book of Psalms. Those superscriptions above each psalm are as ancient as the scriptures themselves. They're part of the scripture. And so the Bible says that David wrote this psalm when the Philistines captured him in Gath. This was before David became king over Israel. And at that time in his life, he was on the run trying to escape a crazed man, the king of Israel at that time, King Saul. King Saul knew that David would become the next king of Israel in his place. And so he was jealous and he was raging and he was doing everything he could do to destroy David. And so David's just running all over the place trying to get away from him. He comes to a certain priest, a priest by the name of Ahimelech, and he asked Ahimelech, David said, can, can you give me something to use for my protection? I don't even have any weapons, and can you give me something to eat? And so Ahimelech gave, gave David something to eat, some bread from the, the, tent, the temple, and then he gave him Goliath's gigantic sword. And David had taken that sword from Goliath when he had killed the giant many years earlier, but now he has this big, big sword, as big as a giant would need, and he's dragging that along with him, and he goes into the hometown of Goliath, the city called Gath. And he gets in there, and he's got, listen, Goliath was the hometown hero. David conquered him, and now he's got that sword as a reminder to everyone, I'm the guy who killed your hometown hero. He comes in, he's afraid for his life, so he has a plan. He decides if he acts like he's crazy, Maybe the king of Gath will protect him and just let him stay there. So I don't know what he does, but he just acts like a crazy man. And the king of the city of Gath says, listen, I've got enough crazy people in my city already. And then his armies are pursuing David and Saul's armies are pursuing David. Everyone is fighting against him. So as he's being captured by the Philistines, he calls out to God. Look in verse one, he says, be merciful to me, O God. For man would swallow me up. In other words, he says, I know that my enemies are able to destroy me and swallow me up completely. And then he just describes what his enemies are doing. He says, fighting all day, he oppresses me. That word oppress is a Hebrew word that they used in other places to describe hyenas chasing after a gazelle and chasing and chasing and chasing until the gazelle was completely wearied and worn out. And then the hyenas jumped on that animal and destroyed it. That, that was uh, the word oppress. Fighting all day, he oppresses me. Verse two, my enemies would hound me all day. There are many who fight against me, O Most High. Here's what I want you to see. David's fear was real. He keeps on going and talking about what his enemies were doing. Look in verses five and six. He says, all day they twist my words. David says, I'm afraid to say anything because my enemies will take everything I say and twist it and use it against me. Have you ever been there? where you're afraid to even say anything, afraid to put anything in an email, afraid to respond by text message, afraid to speak up in a conversation because you have real people who are really against you, real enemies, and you're afraid that they'll twist what you say and turn it into something else. That's where David was. All day they twist my words. All their thoughts, verse five again, all their thoughts are against me for evil. He said, Lord, my enemies are just trying to come up with new ways to destroy me every day. 
They've got opposition research doing all kinds of things just to find more ways to harm me. They gather together. They hide. They mark my steps. They lie in wait when they lie in wait for my life. And so he says the fear he was experiencing was real. The, the, The question of fear and whether you're going to be afraid is really no question. There will be things in your life that cause you real fear. The question is, what are you going to do with that fear? The fear is without question. You will experience things that make you afraid. What will you do with that fear? Not too long ago, I I was going through something that was causing real fear in my life. And I think about David and what he was experiencing because of his fear. All of the symptoms that come with fear, shortness of breath and your heart racing and your mouth drying up and your muscles intensifying and, and your, your mind just racing all the time and you can't concentrate on much of anything else because the fear is so great. David was going through a time of fear like that with all of those symptoms. I can remember a time when I was going through fear in my life and a wise Christian man simply told me this. He said, put this in the Lord's hands Trust him to take care of it. He just said, put this whole thing in the Lord's hands and trust him to take care of it. And here's what I learned. As I deliberately and intentionally took the situation, sometimes took people and just placed them in the Lord's hands and trusted him to take care of it, he took care of every fear. And he'll do the same thing in your life. Fear is real. But the good news is Jesus Christ has conquered our fears. True story. A group of kids walk to school on a certain street every day. A good-sized group of kids. And they walk down a sidewalk. And that sidewalk went right past a house where there was this boxer dog on a chain. And every day he saw those kids, he went crazy. He would run out the length of that chain. He would pull against the chain, just straining, trying to, trying to break the chain loose. And he was barking and he was growling and he was doing all kinds of things. And they were very frightened. And so when they be- began to get close to that house, they started crossing to the other side of the street to get as far away from that dog as they could. One day they were crossing and they, they saw that dog and he began to, to run out the length of his chain and to strain against the chain and barking and all those things. And they got on the other side of the street. And as they did, they saw the man who owned the dog. He was standing it on his front porch and he saw the whole thing. The next morning, they went down the same street. They came to the same house. They got ready to cross across the street, get on the other sidewalk. And as they did that, the man was there. And this time he had his dog on a leash. And he was calling after them. And he said, hey, wait, you don't need to be afraid of my dog. You don't need to be afraid of my dog. And they didn't know whether he was going to let the dog loose on them. They didn't know what he was going to do. But he kept saying, you don't need to be afraid of my dog. And finally, they stopped. And he called them over a little bit closer. And hesitantly, they got a little closer. Again, he said, you don't need to be afraid of my dog. And then he pulled up that dog's top lift to reveal the dog had not one tooth in its head, not one tooth. He said, my dog doesn't have any teeth. So even if he breaks his chain, even if he comes after you, even if he gets you, the worst he can do is gum you. He really can't do anything to hurt you. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He defeated death and hell forever. If you don't need to be afraid of death, if you don't need to be afraid of hell, then you don't need to be afraid of anything else. He has defanged your greatest enemy, the devil. You don't need to be afraid. So when something comes that causes you fear, intentionally say, Lord, I'm going to put this in your hands and I'm going to trust you to take care of it. I'm going to put this person at work in your hands, trust you to take care of that person. I'm going to put this person who's twisting my words into your hands, trust you to take care of that person. 
I'm going to put this situation with my health into your hands, Lord, and trust you to take care of it. I'm going to put this situation that's causing me fear that's going to happen next week, and and it's just bothering me because it's going to happen. Lord, I'm putting it in your hands, and I'm trusting you to take care of it. The Word of God talks about the reality of fear. Secondly, I want you to see this. The Bible talks about the reaction of faith. The reaction of faith. Look in verses three and four of the text. And there David writes this, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Notice when he says he's gonna trust in the Lord, whenever. Not sometimes when he's afraid, not, not when the fears are small and manageable. No, he says, whenever I am afraid, whatever makes me afraid, wherever I'm afraid, it is a unilateral decision. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. He says that in verses three and four. He says it again in verses 10 and 11. Look in verse 11. In God, I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And the truth is, he's already told us all kinds of things that men can do to him. But he says, even though I know that man can do all of these things, I'm not gonna count that as anything. I'm gonna say that's nothing to me because Lord, I am trusting in you. And if you'll just look in the verses in between, verses 3 and 4 and verses 10 and 11, you'll see why David placed his faith and trust in God. He placed his faith and trust in God because of the, the trustworthiness of God's promises. Look in verse 4. He says, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what can flesh do to me. He says, I will praise your word. Listen, the word of God gives us God's promises that never break. His promises help us to trust in him. Then look in verse seven. He says, God, because your anger is righteous and because your judgment is sure, I will trust in you. He says, shall they, his enemies, escape by iniquity? He says, shall they do evil and then escape? He says, no, in anger, cast down the peoples, O God. He was trusting in God to take care of his enemies and to cast them down. Look in verse eight. He talks about the faithful care of God. He says, you number my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? He says, Lord, I I don't even know the direction I'm going in. I'm just wandering around sometimes. I'm just running from place to place trying to get away from my enemies. But Lord, you number my wanderings. You know exactly where I am and you know where I need to go next and you'll be there when I get there. You number my wanderings and so I'm trusting in you. He says, you put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? David knew every time that his fear caused him to cry, that God caught those tears because they are precious to the Lord. And God recorded every day of David's life in his book. When your fears are so great and when your tears are flowing, when you think nobody sees, nobody knows, nobody cares, God captures your tears in his bottle. He numbers your days. He sees you. His faithful care will cause you to trust in him. And then he also says, look in verse 9. He says, God's ability to answer prayer causes him to trust in him. He says, when I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. And finally, in verse nine at the end, he says, I'm trusting in you, Lord, because I know you're for me. This I know because God is for me. God is for you. And because God is for you, everything's all right. You know, someone has said that fear stands for F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Maybe you've heard that before. And and that's a fine acronym for fear. But the truth is, sometimes the things that we are afraid of really are real. So it's not always false evidence appearing real. Can I tell you something else I think fear stands for? Forgetting everything's all right. I fear when I forget everything's all right. If God is for me, everything's all right. A few years ago, our family was at this big amusement park and we spent the whole day there. We rode all kinds of rides. We, we had ridden, I had ridden 
every roller coaster in the park except for one. And there was one roller coaster I just wasn't interested in riding. It was a Star Trek themed roller coaster called the Borg Assimilator. I'll tell you about this roller. You don't have to know anything about Star Trek, really, because it has nothing to do with, with Star Trek. It was just a scary, scary roller coaster. And, and we stood there. We, it was a fascinating thing to watch. I just didn't want to get on it because here's how this roller coaster worked. They started by strapping you in a harness and you sort of lay down on your back on, on, uh, with your back against the track of this roller coaster. And then they took you up the first hill. You know, that hill that gets you way up in the air to start everything rolling. And so you go up that first hill, hill ka-thunk, 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 on your back. You can't see where you're going. You're just sort of looking out and you're going up and you can't see where the top is. You're just, the, the track's back here and you're, you're just going up. Then when you got to the top of the track, right before you went down the first big hill, that harness you were in, you flipped over and you're just hanging. You're not sitting, there's nothing, you just got a strap and a harness and you're just hanging there and that's the Borg assimilator. I didn't feel like getting assimilated that day. I was not interested in that. So I was just glad to watch everybody else ride and I watched and what I noticed was when, when they flipped you over like a pancake, they had a net underneath that, a big net underneath that part of the roller coaster and it was filled with hats and sunglasses and, and, and cell phones and all, no arms or legs, but I mean all kinds of stuff there. And I had no interest in riding that ride. We were there, Michelle, our son Joshua, who was very young, he was too small to ride that roller coaster. And then Michelle's mom and dad, her mom doesn't ride roller coasters. Her dad, Aubrey Henderson, loves to ride roller coasters. Her sister was there. She wasn't interested in riding another roller coaster. And Michelle said to me, Stephen, my daddy wants to ride that roller coaster. I said, great, wonderful. Have a great time. She said, she said I want you to ride that roller coaster with my daddy. Now, I was about 37 years old. He was 72, and he wanted to ride that roller coaster. I said, I don't want to ride this roller coaster. She said, my daddy wants to ride this roller coaster. I said, okay. So we got in line. I was scared. I'll just tell you, I was afraid. Nobody else seemed to be afraid. Aubrey, my father-in-law, he wasn't afraid. The guy behind me wasn't afraid. The nine-year-old girl in front of us in line, she wasn't afraid. <laughs> but I was afraid. And we had a long, long line to wait in before that roller coaster started. I mean, they made you wait a long time before they put you through this misery. And so I'm waiting and we finally come to our place and they strap us in. Aubrey's right beside me. There we are, just the two of us. We're there strapped in on our backs and we're going up that first big hill. Thunk, thunk, thunk. And I'm scared to death. And Aubrey's like, he's looking around. He said, he said, Stephen, you need to look. You can see everything from up here. I said, I don't want to look. I'm just barely even able to hold on. I, he, I said, aren't you afraid? And I'll never forget it. What he, said. he said, I'm not afraid of one ride in this park. He said, look and just see what you can see. And I started looking. And, I, and then just as I started looking, that thing flipped us over and I was hanging. And we took the whole ride. It was awesome. You know why? I was strapped in, everything was all right. I don't care what fear you're facing. I don't care how big that fear is, it doesn't matter. If you know Jesus Christ, everything's all right. Fear is forgetting everything's all right. But listen, if you know Jesus, everything's all right. He died on the cross to conquer sin, everything's all right. He conquered hell and Satan forever. Everything's all right. He came out of that tomb on the third day. Everything's all right. He lives inside of you and he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Everything's all right. David recognized everything was all right. And so he says, I'm going to praise the Lord. I put my trust in God. I will not be afraid. What can man do? To me, He talks about the reaction of faith when we're experiencing some of our greatest fears. I want you to see a third thing in this text and then I'm going to be done for today. Number three, the Bible talks about the requirement of following. The requirement of following our God as he brings you through your fears. Look in verses 12 and 13 of the text. David says, vows made to you 
are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. When David was in those places where he was hurting the most, he had cried out to God. Look in verse 9 again. When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. One of the things I've been praying for, just just stop just for a moment. Just look right here. I, I want to speak to your heart just for a moment. One of the things I've been praying for during this series is that we would cry out to God and bring our hurts and our fears and our pain to him as never before. In just a few moments, when our service is coming to an end, when my message comes to an end, we're going to sing a final song. We're we're not there yet. I'm just sort of letting you know what's going to happen. But we're going to sing a final song. Our our ministers will be here at the front. But then I've asked some other people to come. And I've especially asked some ladies to come and be here at the front just to pray with people. Somebody called me last week and said, Pastor, you know, I think there are a lot of people. She said, I think there are a lot of of people who have real needs they need to pray about. She said, but I wonder if it'd be helpful if if there were women here to to pray with women and girls and and then men to pray with men, just that people might share a little bit more if they could share that way and pray that way. And so for the rest of this series, at at the end of the service, we're going to have people here at the front just to pray with you, for you to call out to God. There's some people in this room who just, you need to come. You need to do that today. That's that's why we get together. We're here to pray for one another, to encourage one another, and to help one another grow in Jesus Christ. One of the things we said last week, talking about our hurts, only Jesus can heal you, but other people can help you. And there's some other people who are here who want to help you and pray with you. And so I hope you'll come and do that. David cried out to God when he was hurting. In verse 12, the Bible says that he made vows to God. Look again in verse 12. Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. David had made vows to God when he was praying and calling out to God. The word vow there means a solemn, deep promise to God. And it was almost always accompanied by a sacrifice. When the people would make a vow to God, they would bring an animal and sacrifice it to the Lord just to show how serious that vow was. David had made vows to God when he was hurting. And now God had brought him through the fear and God had brought him through the hurt. And here's what David said. Those vows I made to you when I was afraid, vows made to you are now binding upon me, O God. You know, sometimes we pray what people have called foxhole prayers. You know, a foxhole prayer comes from the soldier in the foxhole and he's under heavy fire and he doesn't think that he's going to make it. And so he begins to cry out to God and tell God all kinds of things and ask God to deliver him. And usually foxhole prayers involve some some bargaining where we say something like, God, if you'll do this, fill in the blank, then I'll do this. And we tell God what we're going to do. I've talked to people who've said, hey, I don't want to pray a foxhole prayer. Can I tell you something? There's nothing wrong with a foxhole prayer. If you're in a foxhole, you better pray a foxhole prayer. But here's the thing. There's a problem when you pray the foxhole prayer and forget the promises you made to God once you get out of that foxhole. Some of you are here and maybe that's what you've done. Maybe when you were 12 years old or somewhere there around, or maybe when you were 20 years old, you got really frightened about your eternity. You were scared of going to hell and you called on God and asked him to save you from hell. And since you prayed that prayer, you've never really followed Jesus since then. The Bible says, vows made to you are binding upon me. Oh, God. Maybe your son or daughter had a terrible fever and they went into some type of seizure. And you began to pray for that little boy or that little girl to come out of that seizure. 
And you said, Lord, if you'll just take this fever away and make this child well, I'll serve you like I've never served you before. You prayed a foxhole prayer. And then the Lord made things well and you sort of forgot that prayer. The Bible says, vows made to you are binding upon me, oh God. Maybe there's been some other instance in your life when, when you, listen, nothing wrong with that foxhole prayer, but can I tell you, you show that you meant the prayer by what you do after God brings you through the foxhole. After he's delivered you from the fear, you show whether you meant that prayer by what you do next. David says, vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. He's talking about the requirement of following God after the fear is gone. He says, I will render praises to you for you have delivered my soul from death. God, I'm going to praise you and glorify you with all of my life because you've delivered my soul from death. And then he says, have you not kept my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living? He says, God, you, you kept my feet from falling. Now I want to walk before you. I'm going to please you with my steps. I'm going to walk in a way that pleases you. I'm going to live in a way that pleases you. Because I know you delivered me from my fear. There's an old saying that says, danger past, God forgotten. Too many times that characterizes us. We call out to God when we're hurting. And then when the hurt goes away, we say, okay, I'm fine. And we just forget about God. He calls us to keep looking to him in our fears. One of my favorite stories is about a journalist who spent some time with a shepherd out in the plains of Texas. And this shepherd had 2,000 sheep that he was taking care of and herding. All day long for several days, this journalist watched and recorded all the things he saw the shepherd do. And he tells about something that happened one night. It was the end of the day, all the sheep were falling asleep, gathered around this big fire that the shepherd had built. The sheep dogs were there on either side of the flock, guarding over them, but they were asleep as well. And then, somewhere in the middle of the night, they heard a coyote howl from this direction. And then almost immediately, another coyote answered back from the opposite direction. The sheep dogs immediately got up. They were looking out. They began to bark. The sheep were restless. They knew that there was danger close by. They started calling out, crying and bleeding. The shepherd got up and put some additional logs on the fire. And when he did, the fire just began to, to glow and, 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 and just, just ignite in a bigger way. And the journalist looked out and he said, when that fire got big, he looked out and saw what looked like 4,000 lights all looking toward the shepherd. He recognized it was the light of that fire reflected in the eyes of the sheep. And here's what he wrote. He said, when danger came, the sheep did not face outward toward the danger. They look back toward the shepherd. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, he will face your fears. He wants you to keep looking to him. The sheep always look to the shepherd. And the shepherd always delivers the sheep. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we pray together. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation and response. There are going to be people here to pray with you. There are going to be ministers to pray with you. There'll be other people here to pray with you. And can I tell you the people who are here to pray with you, 
you can tell them as much or as little as you want to tell them. They're people who are experienced in, in ministry. They've experienced some things themselves. You don't need to worry about, will this shock them? You can share anything as little or as much as you want to share. You can just come and say, I, I need somebody to pray with me. Or you can come and say, I need somebody to pray with me about this. But there's someone, you just come and there's someone who will find you. We're looking for you to pray with you today. I'm praying that many will come. I'm praying for young people to come. There are young people facing fears today. I'm praying for children to come. There are children and parents facing fears today. I'm praying for people who have been Christians for a long time. We face fears even after we've been believers for a long time. You come today. You may want to come and pray with someone. You may want to come and pray at these steps. Remember, only Jesus can heal you. But other people can help you. We're here to help you today. Father, we give this time of invitation to you. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we can say, I will trust in you and I will not be afraid. Lord, give your people today your grace to conquer their fears. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to pay the price for our sins. Thank you for rising from the grave to give us your gift of eternal life so that in you there's nothing for us to fear. I pray for those here today who need to come and be saved. Lord, show them right now that if they call on you, you will save them. You'll give them your gift of eternal life. We give this time of invitation to you. We pray that you would use it. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, will you just stand right where you are? Just heads are bowed and eyes are closed, but stand right where you are. There are people here to receive you, waiting for you right now, people to pray with you right now. They're here at the front. Some are looking out. Some are just on the front rows, but they're here to pray with you. You can come even as I'm speaking. If there's some need in your life, you come. And then certainly as we pray, you come. Lord God, give people today courage to face their fears, courage to bring their fears to you in prayer. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You come. You come as we sing together. And speak to me when the silence steals my voice. You understand me. You understand me. Come to me in the valley of unknowns. You understand me. You understand me. You understand me, God. You understand me. So I threw all my cares before you. My doubts and fears don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. And I stop all negotiations when the God of all creation, you're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. And I believe, but help my own. You understand me, you understand me, and help me reach the faith that's underneath. You understand me, you understand me, you understand me, God, you understand me. Through all my cares before you, my doubts and fears don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. And I stop all negotiations when the God of all creation. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. Of 
Father's hands Leave the rest In the Father's hands I will rest In the Father's hands Leave the rest In the Father's hands I will rest I will rest In the Father's hands Leave the rest In the Father's hands So I throw all my cares before you My doubts and fears don't scare you You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought And I'll stop all negotiations When the God of all creation You're bigger than I thought you were You're bigger than I thought One more time, I'll rest I will rest In the Father's hands Leave the rest In the Father's hands Father, we thank you for your presence in this place today. We thank you, God, that you are greater than any of our fears. You are greater than any of our hurts. Lord, you're greater than the guilt that we may feel over our past. You're greater than the worries we may have about tomorrow. And we thank you, God, that you know us so perfectly. Nothing about us is hidden from you. And so we can come to you. And we can bring our hearts to you. We thank you that your word tells us to pray for one another that we may be healed. Your word tells us to bear one another's burdens and so to fulfill the law of Christ. Lord, help us to be faithful, to pray for one another. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us to be a family together in this church. May we minister to one another your healing and your grace as you give us opportunities. Thank you, Lord, for the way you're working. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for your cross, for your resurrection, for your Holy Spirit who lives within us, for your presence with us day by day, for the promise of your return, and for the bright future that we have forever because of you. We pray all of these things, Jesus, in your holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Hasn't it been a great morning? Amen. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Thank you for being here this morning. We have a couple of announcements that we want you to know about. The first is that this Thursday, May the 5th, is the National Day of Prayer. We'd love for you to join us in the chapel at 7.30 a.m. We'll have a minister-led time of prayer. And then the chapel will remain open until 5 p.m. on Thursday for individual prayer. Also, there's a couple of things going on tonight that we want you to know about. First is tonight is the Praise Kids Spring program, and that'll be at 5.30 in the chapel. And then immediately following that will be a special called business meeting where we will have the opportunity to approve the bylaw amendments. We thank you for your faithfulness to continue to give. That is such a blessing. And as a reminder, we just want you to know that you can drop your tithes and offerings in the black boxes on the way out, or you can give online at qsbc.org slash give. So we are so blessed to be at QSBC where we gather together, build out, 
build up and send out. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this special day. Thank you for the opportunity that we've had today to recognize and honor our seniors. Thank you for our student ministry, Lord. We love them, and we're so thankful for what they do in the lives of our students. Be with each one of the families that are represented here today as they prepare for graduation and all that comes afterwards. We thank you that you have your hand on them. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. We thank you that we can bring all of our hidden hurts to you because when you're the center of our lives, Lord, everything really is okay. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.